Okay, um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Ken Medlock. I am one of the energy fellows here at the Baker Institute and uh, also sit in the economics department, um, which I will come back to in just a minute. Um, uh, I was uh, uh, informed um, uh, in, in thinking about how to prepare my remarks uh, that this is actually the fourth book um, that uh, has the energy forums uh, moniker on it. Um, Amy's in no small part responsible for that. Um, but uh, uh, as a program, we have over 250 academic publications. So we have actually been very busy uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, publishing uh, in terms of the studies we've put out and the work that we've done. And it's all been uh, very well received, as I'm sure most of you will, will enjoy this book. Um, uh, Amy Jaffe, who is the uh, uh, director of the Energy Forum, and Mahmoud Al-Gamal, who is the chair of the Economics Department, collaborated on this piece. Um, and uh, they both brought um, uh, the culmination, if you will, of their expertise to, uh, 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 to bear here. And I think you'll see it as you read through the book. It's actually, uh, I've skimmed through it. I haven't had time to read the whole thing. But, um, uh, and I actually talked with them as they were writing it. So I, I have a pretty good understanding of what's in it. Um, I think it's a very good piece. And it's, it's um, um, uh, in terms of what it brings to the table, it's a, it's a fresh look at an old, old issue, if you will. Uh, and uh, hopefully it will be enlightening to, to most of you as you read through it. Um, uh, I think it certainly will spark some interesting conversations uh, down the road among policymakers and academics alike. Um, the fact that Amy and Mahmoud worked together on this book is, is, uh, is actually very interesting in itself because it, it, it is sort of symbolic uh, with regard to what's happening here at Rice in the energy program uh, uh, and energy studies in general. Um, at the Baker Institute, we have a very close relationship with the economics department. Um, so in that sense, it's symbolic that uh, uh, Amy and Mahmoud work together on this book. Um, but as the Energy Forum has grown, so has interest in energy in the economics department in particular at Rice. Um, we uh, just this past year instituted a, a, a field in energy economics uh, amongst our PhD uh, students, so in the PhD program in economics at Rice. And uh, we have a couple of graduate students who have already, um, well, for the most part, uh, completed their, their, uh, their dissertations and have moved into the private sector and are doing quite well. Um, so uh, over time, as our program expands even more, um, you will see more and more of a rice footprint in the energy sector. And I think that's something we are very, very proud of. Um, so the format today um, is uh, I think Mahmoud will stand up and speak for a few minutes uh, about some of the issues that um, uh, that are uh, within the book, and then Amy will get up and make a few additional comments, and then we'll do a little bit of Q and A after each of them has has had their turn at the podium, if you will. So, with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Mahmoud. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ken, and uh, thank you all for. Uh, showing up before the big game. Uh, we promise not to keep you long. So uh, um, I, I have to say that uh, the book is symbolic of the, uh, of the partnership that we have between the academic side, you know, the, the pure research and educational side of RISE and the policy studies uh, part of RISE. But I think nothing symbolizes that more than Ken himself. Uh, you recognize, I mean, we're very proud. Ken is one of our own PhDs, and actually, uh, at least one of his advisors I see is here. And, and yeah, both, both of his main advisors turned co-authors uh, are here. And um, uh, he's, um, he's, he's one, you know, despite his young years, he's, he's one of the rising stars of energy economics. And, uh, and we think you're going to hear a lot about him over the years. Um, let me um, uh, start by saying working with Amy is a very interesting experience. Uh, for any of you who have worked with Amy, she's, she's the, the fiercest but also the greatest taskmaster I've ever had to deal with. And I've had some pretty tough bosses at the IMF and the Treasury. Uh, and you know, there you basically have to finish the, the policy paper yesterday. Um, well, with Amy, it's the day before yesterday. So, uh, and, and she gets it done. Uh, I don't think this book would have, would have even started without um, her tireless uh, efforts uh, and, and certainly wouldn't have been finished without it. So um, I'm grateful for the opportunity and I think uh, I've learned a lot in the process. But 
I thought instead of telling you only what's in the book, um, I'll tell you what's not in the book and how sort of I, I, I came to this project, you know, from a completely different angle. And then how Amy and I eventually found this, this common ground where we think we can make a contribution and, um, and what we think beyond the book, um, we, we have learned from this experience uh, of writing the book. So I was sitting in the International Banking Office at the Department of Treasury in 2004 uh, watching what had happened to VIX, for the, the, the volatility index, watching the volatility of various asset classes that people were investing in. And, and volatility was very low, and people were talking about um, sort of the, um, the age of, of, of boredom uh, in, in, in the investment world. And yet I was thinking, well, there are all these hedge fund managers sitting there with investors expecting double-digit returns. And they recognized that if they were to leverage a lot more than is advisable, they could probably squeeze out these double-digit returns. They'd be taking huge risks. But guess what? The um, you know, Gresham's law of markets is the, the, the bad money kicks out the good. So when volatility is still low, uh, even though they're leveraged up to their ears, they're the ones who are producing the double-digit returns. The, the actual prudent investors will be driven out of the market. And so everybody would be borrowing. And then there are very few pickings out there you know, they're seeking volatility. The only thing that's moving is oil prices, especially in 2004, you know, after the invasion of Iraq, oil prices start moving up a little bit. They're just looking for anything that moves on their screen. They find this is moving, they start borrowing, they start buying. And at the same time, there was this big literature that was brewing on the um, asymmetries in trade, you know, the financial imbalances. In particular, most people were talking about the imbalances between China and the United States. China was lending us so that we'll consume beyond our means, so that we'll buy more Chinese exports, and on and on we go. And um, one way to bet that what economists have always been saying uh, in this situation will happen, which is that the dollar would have to depreciate vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese yuan, um, is to bet on oil prices because if China is going to continue to grow, it's going to continue to demand more and more oil. So that's sort of a real demand side. If uh, the dollar is going to depreciate, then the real price of oil staying constant would mean that the nominal price of oil, the dollar denominated price of oil, should be going up. And um, so it's a, double, it's a double bet. It's an easy one. Um, and it's very dangerous. Uh, and I started thinking back to long-term capital, 1998. You know, it was a humongous hedge fund that had borrowed too much to invest on whatever was moving at the time. Another time when VIX was very low, when there were very few pickings. Um, and I said, well, you know, okay, so there is no long-term capital right now, but there are lots and lots of these guys sitting in Greenwich, Connecticut, who can borrow huge amounts of money, whose lenders don't have to know what they're investing in, and who are probably all investing in the same thing. So when they all fall, they all fall together and it's not long-term capital, but it's a whole lots of pieces that look just like long-term capital. So, and I was working with um, one of my PhD students here, Hulusi Inanlo, who was then at the OCC. Now he's at the Federal Reserve Board because they're starting to get interested in what we were working on, which is uh, the applications of an area called extreme value theory, which uh, I have to tell you, the guys who search my bags every time I fly in are very interested in, and I have to explain to them, that's just a statistical technique. It has nothing to do about being an extremist. You know, look, it's math. So, but nonetheless, um, so we're using extreme value theory to look at various portfolios and saying, well, you know, maybe when you think that you're diversified, um, you are if markets are moving just a little bit. But when markets start moving a lot, they all fall together. We certainly saw that when we had the Asian crisis flying over to Brazil flying over to Russia, right? Because the investors who were investing in those places thought that they were being hedged, that they were diversifying. But in fact, when things had big movements, they had big movements together. So I walked over to the research department at Treasury and got people excited. We walked over to um, John Taylor, who was a you know, great economist from Stanford, who was then undersecretary and, and, and uh, the guy who hired me. And John said, I don't believe in contagion. Fundamentals drive the markets. So, okay. So I, I called up my colleagues here at the Jones School and I said, you know what, I, I'm, I'm working on this model of how low volatility can be very dangerous because it lulls people to sleep and they borrow a lot and nothing is happening so they borrow even more to generate more returns. And then eventually when volatility comes back, everything 
falls together. And the only we have we have a couple of, of, of famous people in the area of VIX, you know, Jeff Fleming and, and Barbara Ostick, and said, you know, there, there are no models. High volatility is bad. Low volatility is never bad. And so sort of the idea just died. Continued just doing statistics, you know, stuff that only five people in the world would care to read. And then I'm back here, and Amy, again, for those of you who don't know Amy, she seems to have about 48 hours a day, and she can spend about 96 of them talking to each person. So she's just walking around in the corridor, you know, looking for more slaves to write stuff for her. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I'm a poor soul just sitting there, you know, doing my math, and, and she walks in and she says, you know what, they, they, uh, you know, Yale University Press asked me if, if I'd write a book on petrodollars, but you know, I don't do finance. You know, why don't you do that for us? And I said, well, that's interesting because I'm thinking about that stuff, but I know nothing about energy markets. You know that stuff. Why don't we you know, think about writing this together? So we write the proposal. We send it to the publisher that had solicited it. And we get back referee reports that say, well, you know, there may be a point there, you know, the interaction between financial markets and energy markets, but you guys ought to tone down this extravagant language about how fragile the international financial system is. It makes you sound really silly. <laughs> um, so we went back and forth saying, no, you know, we, 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 think, we think we're on pretty solid ground on this. You know, this has happened before. You, know, you go back a century, there was a lot of, of globalization. The system did break down. You know, this looks a lot like the Roaring Twenties. It can happen again. And you know, we have a pretty good story here. And eventually, we change publishers. You know, we, 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 we can't agree with them. So we call up our editor at Cambridge. And he says, well, send me the proposal. So, and then we start writing the book. And the book says, OK, so we understand now the interaction between energy markets and financial markets simply because financial investors think of energy commodities as one of the asset classes in which they can invest. And certainly, the innovations that we've made in derivatives trading have made this much easier for people to, to do nowadays. And um, we start working, OK, so, so what, what, how exactly do the interactions work? OK, so there's this secular business cycle. And as global uh, demand, global output grows, with it grows demand for energy. But it takes a very long time to produce um, capacity in order to produce more fuel. So you know, this is just like the construction cycles. Um, so we understand that energy prices eventually have to go up because demand is going to outpace supply. You know, for a while it can, while you have excess capacity, eventually you run out of excess capacity and price has to come up. Once price comes up, now you have this class of investors, and Ken, I have to say, has done much better work on this uh, uh, now, and, and hopefully that study will be coming out uh, soon. But once something is moving up, you know, investors, financial investors, the trend is their friend, right? They see something going up, they start buying into it. Because they're buying into it, it's going up. So because it's going up, they buy into it. Add to that, that what they're buying into are you know, these oil futures. And that's bringing up the spot price of, 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 of fuel, brings up the amount of money that's flowing into the oil producing countries. And you know, we're looking at Saudi Arabia, we're looking at Kuwait, and we're seeing the same stuff that we saw in the late 70s, early 80s. Real estate bubbles followed by stock market bubbles. And eventually the money will come rushing out. And then it's going to create a credit crisis. It's happened before. You know, it's, it's the exact same scenario. The story has to be different, slightly different. So back in the early 1980s, the story was that countries never go out of business, right? CEO of Citi told us that. So he could take all these petrodollars and lend countries in Latin America and North Africa and the Middle East uh, because countries are, are good bets. And then, of course, we had a sovereign credit crisis. Well, this time around, it was home prices never go down. Um, and we know how that ended. So you know the, 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 the mechanics are, are very familiar, very similar. The money goes in, the money comes back out. But there's an added twist here, because this money that's going to the Saudis and the Kuwaitis and so on is not only going to bankers, it's also going to these personal bankers. They're high net worth individuals that, that are sending their money to their favorite money managers in, in Switzerland, and then they're shuffling that to the guy sitting in Greenwich, Connecticut with an old Lehman connection who's buying up oil futures. So we have an amazing feedback mechanism 
Well, we can't prove it because these guys will never tell us what they're doing, right? I call up my friends in Greenwich, Connecticut, and I say, well, you know, buying oil futures seems like a very good double bet on China continuing to grow and the dollar going down. And they say, hmm, good point, but we're not going to tell you what we're doing. So you never know, right? It's impossible to, to we, you can try to impute stuff, but they'll never tell you exactly what they're doing. So we knew this connection. And then we noticed, well, there's a part of the story that's missing. We have the energy markets, we have the financial markets, we see how they feed into each other. They amplify the upswing, and then eventually they amplify the downswing. But it doesn't happen smoothly. You know, it's, it's a punctuated process. We have 73, we have 79, we were just talking, there's 56 before that. And why do we have these punctuations? And then we found they always happen about periods of geopolitical strife. You know, it's like these investors are waiting for a signal, you know, in, in, in game theorists, that they're waiting for, 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 for a signal to correlate on, right? We're all sitting there saying, oh, these guys are going to jump on this market at some point. And then we see that news item flash on the screens and we'll say, ah, this must be it. I know these guys are going to be buying, so I have to buy before they do. And voila, we created the trend and the trend is our friend and we know what happens next. So we said, well, there's that third part, which is the geopolitics. And the geopolitics feeds into those two in a very interesting way as well, because you know, a little bit of terrorism is good for business if you're an oil exporter. And also, when you have a lot of petrodollars coming in, you can buy people off. You know, these people can eventually turn against you, but at least for a while, you can buy them off. So things sort of quiet down. And then eventually, when you don't have dollars to buy people off, they get angry, and that restarts the cycle. And so we said, well, let's take those three parts and then you know, write the whole story. So we wrote the story, and we said, and great. And now what we're going to do is once we have these three pieces, we're going to come up with all sorts of scenario, and then we'll bring in experts and try to predict what kind of crisis could happen. Chucks, you know, crisis beats us. You know, we're not, if we were in DC, you know, we'd be on top of the, of, of the news bubble, but we weren't. So the, 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 the crisis beat us. But the good news is the bubble burst, yes, but the crisis was actually very mild. You know, we didn't have what happened in the beginning, you know, a century ago. People didn't rush out of the dollar the way the British pound died. It may still happen. That's, that's the punchline, unfortunately. But, you know, a century ago, the British pound was sitting just right where the dollar is sitting. Now, it took us all the way to World War II for the dollar to supplant the British pound as the primary currency. Uh, of reserves for most countries. So it may still happen if we don't, you know, if we waste this crisis, most likely it will happen again. Because, well, as, as Amy may tell you, I mean, the, the energy part of the story is still the same. You know, the, 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 as I was telling my students in financial markets at the end of the semester, I was showing them um, uh, Pirates at the Gates about the Nabisco, you know, the, the KKR acquisition of Nabisco, and the whole thing, you know, the, the, this time was different because of the smokeless cigarette. And then I talked about clean energy, and I said, well, clean energy may be the current smokeless cigarette. Uh, it's how we're going to justify the next bubble. Um, but, um, you know, the, the people, well, we didn't have as, as big a protectionist reaction to the crisis as, as, as we had between the world wars. It may still happen, but so far it hasn't happened. The flight to quality was very surprising. Instead of people running away from the dollar, they ran to the dollar. But that can only be short-lived. And we think the book is still very valuable, even though the crisis that we set out to sort of predict has already taken place. Because what we know now is that the dynamics that caused this crisis are still in place. They could have caused a much bigger one. And then we spell out what we think are reasonable regulatory, economic, and even political uh, um, uh, stopgap measures that we could put in place to ameliorate the cycle. You can't kill the cycle. It's, uh, you know, I think we have a line there that the business cycle, that the, like the human ego, is most dangerous when we think we have it tamed. You, you, can't, you can't really tame the cycle, but you can at least try to prevent it from completely destroying the system. Um, unfortunately, I mean, you may think whatever you want of Tim Geithner, you know, especially what came out today about the AIG affairs is pretty interesting, but one thing we can all agree on, he ain't no James Baker, right? Basically, in 85, James Baker put together the G7 in the Plaza Hotel in New York City. And some people present probably were, were part of that discussion. And convinced Japan to take one on the chin for the international financial system. And Japan lost a decade for agreeing to appreciate the yen between 85 and 87 until the Louvre Accord. Now, 
You can pull something like that with the Chinese, maybe the system is safe. But we don't have James Baker there. Uh, Bernanke may be a Paul Volcker. That, that remains to be seen. But certainly we don't have James Baker there. So I think it's appropriate that we're standing here and saying, where are you, James Baker? We need you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so Mahmoud has uh, alluded to the secret of the success of the energy program at the Baker Institute, which is that every other program is run by some very serious academic, and uh, the Baker Institute's program is run by a Jewish mother. <laughs> right, and therein lies the success. Um, so, uh, so, so my perspective is that uh, I have this really genius uh, econometrician uh, in, in the department. And uh, at Rice, uh, the big way to be successful is you have to know who the heavy hitters are, and then you have to suck them into your program, right? And, uh, and people uh, tell you things, you know, like when I first arrived, uh, people said to me, there's this guy, Peter Hartley, and he's on sabbatical in Australia, but when he comes back, make sure you catch him first, right? And so, well, like one day when he's still jet lagged, I'm running into his office to talk about, you know, what study we're going to do. And so I, you know, had my vision out there that uh, we, we need to get this, uh, uh, this economist involved with uh, the study, and so when Yale Press called me, and I thought, this is it, this is it, this is the topic, petrodollars, he's expert on the dollar, and he does financial contagion studies, and he does derivatives markets, and you know, this is the perfect topic. And uh, when he suggested we do it together, I thought to myself, you know, how is this going to work? Because I don't know anything about the dollar, nothing, zero. And every time we would like, so we laid out the book, and, you know, we have it, like, really divided up. Like, Mahmoud is going to write these three pages on the dollar, and then I'm going to write the next three pages on oil, and then we'll write the next two pages together that integrates the two things. And what shocked me, as he was sending me the pages on the dollar, was how similar what was happening in the dollar now, which I kind of understood, because, like, the rest of you were all reading it in the newspaper and worrying about our bank accounts, and how close that was to what happened in the 70s. And, you know, I joke with people, uh, Mahmoud and I presented some of this research out in, in China, and then, in Jap and then the Japanese came here, and we had a meeting here, and we presented it again. And I think at the time, gold was trading at like $350 an ounce. And Mahmoud joked to everybody in this workshop, and he said, you know, if you believe in what we're saying, go out and buy gold. And we're all like kicking ourselves, you know, that we didn't get in at 350. So, uh, but over the course we're writing this book, I'm becoming more and more concerned about my bank account. And so I'm like moving my money around and I'm going to Treasury Direct so that I'm out of the banking system. You know what I mean? Because he had me so panic stricken as I'm looking at this data and thinking about, you know, what kind of crisis could really ensue. And I can see the oil price just moving more and more out of control. And you could see this sort of self-fulfilling pattern where people in the market would become pessimistic about the dollar. And part of what makes you pessimistic about the dollar, of course, is that we're having this giant trade deficit, which is driven by the fact that we're shipping all this money to pay $147 for oil. And it, it, it almost seemed unstoppable, like that we were just going to wreck our entire economy because we couldn't get off the oil purchases in any way. And we couldn't strengthen the dollar because we couldn't get off the oil purchases. And you, it was very clear uh, in 2007 that we were on this, you know, collision course with the crisis. And we had a conference in May because we were doing a study on, you know, global risks. And I remember uh, saying this in May of 2007, and uh, my husband's here, so he'll get a laugh out of this story. So uh, in commodities, the big thing in commodities is, you know, people say, well, no, 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 it, you know, it wasn't speculation, it was fundamentals and so on, because, you know, who would buy at the top, right? Because, you know, once the financials all know, they all know, and, you know, why would they get out and who would sell to them? You know, who would, they, who would be on the other side of the transaction? And so my joke is, because I gave a speech at a hedge fund conference around the same time, my joke is that 
doctors and dentists sell to the hedge funds when they know they need to get out, right? And so I come home one day, you know, or in May of 2007, and my husband is, you know, telling me in a distressed way that he's talked to his broker and that they're trying to figure out what he should buy with some, you know, money that's come due. And the guy says he should buy an oil index fund, right? And the market was like at 145 or something like that. I'm like, oh, my God, we're at the top. He's a, <laughs> he's a health litigator. That's like Dr. Dentist category, right? He's Dr. Dentist category, and his broker, his retail broker is telling him to buy oil. i like, we are definitely going down, right? So, um, so indeed we did, as we all know, uh, uh, the story. And, you know, my view was, uh, and then I'll tell you where I think we are now, my view was that we actually could have had a bigger crisis, but the fact that Lehman Brothers was not rescued, and then the banks had to recapitalize their money back to home base, meant they had to come out of the commodities market, right? And they had to pull that money out of the commodities market to put it back on their balance sheet for some period of time, and while they were doing that, that's when we saw the $36. If you look at the fundamentals, there was no reason for the price to, at that, t you know, a couple months ago to have gone back up. I mean, the, the fundamentals were bad, demand, you know, was not good. And, and uh, I think people are starting to see there's some, maybe there's some holes in the China story, in the China miracle. Um, so uh, so what I, where I really think we are now is that, uh, and people tell me after New Year's, people came back to Wall Street and the money just went right back into commodities, right? So you have fresh money in the market. But the fresh money in the market, and Mahmoud mentions this thing about the geopolitical part of the cycle, is I've got this fresh money coming into the market and you know we're gonna start hearing the whole story again, economic growth, you know, and, and the market got, there's always something that gets people started that makes sense, and then it kind of gets out of control. So the thing that got started that makes sense is it was cold out. And it wasn't just cold out in the Northeast, which actually having it be like five degree days below normal in the Northeast for three weeks or a month can actually increase oil demand by a million barrels a day. It's a very powerful driver to oil demand because people, a lot of people still heat with oil and uh, it can really move the market. But you had cold weather across the United States and across Northwest Europe, right? So that is a big boost to oil demand since people believe fundamentally that the market was being held back by the fact that there was a gigantic overhang of oil and inventory. You know, the presumption was that this cold weather was going to drain the inventory and therefore we would come out the other side um, with a stronger market. But the overlay on top of that, and why I think we're going right back to the same place, is that people, well, some of us in the audience who have been around, you know, are going to think this way. These new hedge fund guys are going to, like, figure it out at some point. Somebody's going to pick up a history book. You know, what is the paradigm? The paradigm in 73, people don't remember. There really wasn't much oil cut off in 73. 73 was a political announcement that scared the market. The six million barrels a day that got lost to the market got lost to the market in 79 because there was so much street turmoil in Iran during the days when the, when the students wanted to bring down the, the Shah of Iran that it ended up with so much violence that people working in the oil industry got assassinated and people stopped coming to work and you had strikes in the oil industry and exports from Iran ceased altogether. And that started a much, much bigger crisis uh, that led to the things that we write about in the book that happened in the 80s. You know, we all sort of know that story. So the interesting thing that we have going on today is Iranians are back in the street, and you have turmoil in the political system in Iran, and you could imagine that the government there could fall. And you know, uh, back in the days of neocons and Paul Wolfowitz, he used to have this thing he liked to say, which was that uh, we were going to promote democracy in the Middle East, and once all these countries were democratic, uh, we we're going to have lots and lots of oil and everything was going to be stable. And I used to say, you know, I had a presentation I used to give, I used to call it my anti-Paul Wolfowitz presentation, <laughs> right? 
because I had the list of times that governments had changed in the Middle East. And what it had, I had a little chart. I had different charts that showed, you know, where the, you know, that showed the production of a country going up, Libya, you know, uh, Iran, Iraq, Venezuela. And then you see the change of government moment. Gaddafi comes in, the Shah of Iran leaves, and the Ayatollah comes in, uh, you know, Ch Hugo Chavez comes in, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein comes in, and you see the production line go down. And then 20 years pass, and it never goes back up, right? And I tell people, and that is because somebody needs to know how to turn the widget. And the people who know how to turn the widget, who are in the form of government, if they get thrown out, you can't just train someone in two days to know how to do that. It's a technical business. And I remember sitting at the OPEC meeting uh, with the, I used to, we used to joke that people with the reverse collar would come from Iran. So there would be a delegation from Iran. It would be twice the size of the other delegations. And that's because you had to have 10 people with the reverse collar to babysit the five people who knew something about oil, right? And um, one day, uh, which didn't happen too often because, you know, you can't touch my seat and I, I'm not wearing a veil and all stuff. But one of the guys with the reverse, usually I dealt with the guys who from the Iranian oil industry and, you know, were technical people and know what they're doing. But one day, one of the guys with the reverse collar comes down to the lobby and he says to me, Mrs. Jaffe, would you have a coffee with me? And so we sit down and this is what he wanted to know. He wanted to know, it was in 90 actually, and uh, Fibro Energy, which the Iranians had dealt with because they did a lot of trading out of London, had lost $30 million in 15 minutes. And that is because they were long oil and the United States went in to you know, make good their thing that they were gonna you know, uh, liberate Kuwait and the, uh, the first couple hours, uh, no oil, well, I guess the oil facilities uh, did get damaged, but there was no, you know, conflagration that people were expecting that, uh, you know, all oil supply for the whole Middle East got, was going to get cut off or whatever it was that people had in their minds. And the United States and the Saudis and everybody had a coordinated Saudis raised production. The United States released the SPR. You know, you had this sort of coordinated response. So the oil market went down after the, after the first U.S. action. And Fibro lost all this money. And this guy is asking me, doesn't understand how that could happen. And no one lost their job at DOE or in the U.S. government, that they could cause the large American trading company to lose so much money and no one would lose their job. And he was thinking from his own experience, because if the uh, Bonjads, the Bonyads and, uh, and the Iranian trading company in London had lost $30 million in 15 minutes because of something the Iranian government had decided to do, you know, heads would roll uh, in Tehran and he couldn't get outside, you know, sort of his own experience. Uh, and he, you know, wound up, basically had to spend like the coffee explaining about free markets, right? Uh, but, but the point was that it takes a time for people to build up expertise in oil. You can't really just gain it overnight. And so you have a whole new level of politicians to come in. And if they shuffle out the oil industry, which even happened in Venezuela, uh, then the bounce back time can be very slow. And so if we think about what's going on in the Middle East today with Iran, and you think about the possibility that the government might change, you know, 2007 could look, look like 2007, 1979, right? Where we're going to have a, could have a major disruption. And, um, and the question is, what happens around it? So you have this sort of debate, debate on the news, with, you know, could Yemen become the next Afghanistan? Um, you have the defense minister of Saudi Arabia has been hospitalized for nine months, and there's a lot of jockeying inside Saudi Arabia for what generation is going to replace his position and who's going to be in charge and moving up in the chain uh, in Saudi Arabia, which for those people who watch that, um, 
you know, would make you nervous about the oil market because, you know, who's going to make the decision and who's in charge and will there be consensus and will it be easy consensus? Um, and so really, I think that, you know, when the cold weather eases, we won't see the market come down because you're going to have this risk factor out there that in the end is real, which is, you know, how unstable is the Middle East going to be? What are, the, what are the ramifications? I mean, one of the things about the fall of the Shah was that it had a ripple effect for 10 years afterwards on the whole region. And one would imagine that if the Iranian protesters did indeed succeed in bringing down their government, it's very hard to predict what the sort of trend line, what that would mean in other places in the region and, you know, what the influence might be. And... You know, we like to say that when you have so much supply concentrated in one place, uh, it doesn't even matter if any of it gets cut off, just the possibility that it could or that there are events that are happening that put it more at risk. You know, that gives you a flip in the price of oil. And as Mahmoud is saying, you know, the U.S. government and the, and the European governments, no one, China, no one has done anything to remedy any of the problems we have in terms of regulation and, and debt structure and the behavior um, in derivative markets and so forth. So whatever just happened, you know, it could happen again pretty quickly that this same cycle where the price of oil could go up very high again, you know, based on, um, based on just, you know, jitters about the, what we call the so-called terror premium. I mean, you can have a $30 terror premium. We've seen that in the past couple of years. So if that comes into the market um, and you have the petrodollar flows build up again, and then they have to come back through the banking system into whatever it is that people are willing to invest in. And with the climate being that there's not too many things that people are willing to invest in, you could have these sort of targeted bubbles that could pop again. Um, and the question is, you know, again, like 73, 79 with the second time, you know, be more damaging. And, you know, it's interesting to me because you just don't see the policymakers feeling like there's an emergency out there, like everybody feels they dodged a bullet. So you don't see OPEC talking about increasing production. I mean, the only thing I've seen as a policy that addresses it a little bit is Saudi Arabia announced they're going to put oil in storage in Japan. And you have to ask yourself, you know, why now? What are they concerned about that they're going to ship oil <laughs> to Japan and hold it there, right? I mean, are they thinking that that's, at some future time they want to flood the market? Because, of course, in the past, when they get ready to flood the market, they put oil out in storage. Or are they thinking that Hormoz could get closed and they need to have oil outside? Right. So that's the only signal I see that anybody's given it any thought. Um, and, you know, the possibility of having a second crisis on the crisis, uh, you know, seems pretty viable, actually, uh, when you look at the factors. Right. Yeah, we did talk about that. We, we, we talked, we actually suggested that the uh, countries need to put storage outside. So, uh, so it'd be really interesting to see. And of course, Mahmoud and I, uh, are thinking about signing all your books today so that if there is a second crisis and the book becomes incredibly popular, <laughs> um, you will be able to say you have a signed copy on eBay uh, since we're the only ones out there writing about the crisis So, because everybody else believes it's China, China, China. So uh, anyway, well, listen, we really appreciate your being here today. And Mahmoud and I are going to come up to the table and we'll take your questions. Well, I guess I would say that um, that having stronger players come into shale probably would mean less volatile prices. 
because if the majors come into into a big shale resource, uh, it's not going to be like Chesapeake where they suddenly have to go out to investors and try to keep the money to keep the stuff flowing. Um, and they're not probably not going to be inclined to shut it in because prices went down for a month or two. Um, so I think that probably this thesis that everybody has that you know prices have to stay at five dollars or seven dollars because otherwise the shale will get shut in. The more that the majors are in that game, the less true that's going to be. Um, and it's interesting to me. I mean, I went to a dinner uh, sponsored by one of the big banks that had their sort of hedge fund investing friends, clients, and so forth. And uh, people were very negative on the Exxon acquisition, and that surprised me. Um, and, you know, they're giving me the, you know, P&E ratio and, you know, blah, 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 and they paid this much for a barrel and all that stuff. And, you know, I, I was saying to them, listen, you don't understand. You, you know, this is a big company. You know, they're not worried about what the price of natural gas is going to be a month from now, right? And if you were going to be, you have to be in this play. I mean, this is the play, right? This is the future for, you know, unconventional gas is going to be what deep water was in 1990, right? Now deep water is, you know, sort of the only game in town in exploration and non-OPEC. You know, shale gas is going to be super important. And even though there's a little bit of cannibalism in it, you know, I've got this LNG and now I'm going to be in domestic gas. Um, you know, I, I, of course, the people from Exxon in the audience, so you can ask them. But, you know, from my vantage point as an outsider, you know, if you're going to be in that game, you should be big, right? You should be big. You can't have it be that um, you're in the margin over here with LNG that you may or may not be able to work into a terminal. Um, and I think the potential for shale, you know, it globally is going to be quite large. And so, you know, typically the industry has this technical learning experience here in the United States where the risk is lower. And then people take it abroad. And, you know, I think we're going to see that in shale, and I think that Exxon has well positioned itself, and you're going to see the other majors trying to do the same thing. And then once they're in, you know, my opinion is, it's just my opinion, based on history, is that all these numbers you hear that we need, first it was that we needed $12 to do shale. Then it was like, oh, okay, well, we need $6 to do shale. You know, and, and I was on jury duty, and I won't say which company it was. I was on jury duty with someone from one of the majors. And, you know, you're there for like 12 hours, right? And it was a geologist from one of the companies who does shale. And, you know, people were talking about, this guy was talking about, and I've heard it from other people, you know, get crunching it down, you know, through scale economies and, you know, new technology. I mean, here at Rice, we've developed some ceramic sand uh, for shale that's going to frack the rock better and require less water and so forth. So as we move into those directions, I think we're going to see the, the prices for shale come down, you know, $5, $4, $3, you know, in places like Haynesville. And so it's not going to be this tricky play that um, needs $12 gas. It's going to be a highly competitive play. Well, I think the thing, you know, everybody loves to talk, tell the Brazil story, and it's a very positive story. It's, it's my non-peak oil story, right? I, I, I'm, so I'm not supposed to comment on peak oil because I'm not a geologist, and I, as Matt Simmons always says, you know, these economists give their opinion on it, you know? So, uh, but I think the point is that the Brazilian play is a long play. In other words, this isn't the field you're going to cut bring on in two years and then produce it. I mean, it's going to take them a long time uh, to develop that production. Um, but it, it gets to sort of what I'm saying about the shale, too. It gets to people need to think more, I think, carefully about what happens after a crisis, right? Because when we get to the end of the crisis, like we sort of seem to be now, the whole industry assumes, whew, okay, you know, everything's going to go back to normal. We're going to have 3 to 4% global demand. China's going to go back to 12% oil demand growth, 
right? All these things are going to be the same. And it never turns out that way, right? You have these major structural changes in the industry, and we're going to see that again. And, and the pre-salt and what the cost will eventually do for pre-salt, you know, you will eventually see those supply come out. There will be a non-OPEC response. You know, some, one of the journalists called me to tell me that U.S. production was up uh, the end of this year by more than it has been since 1970. And they wanted to attribute that to the $147. And I said to them, you know, you have to understand the time lag. We haven't even seen the oil that the $147 brought on yet. You know, we're not going to see that for five years. So this is even more dramatic because we're seeing it before. That's even just the little pop we had in 2003 is bringing this. So, you know, yeah, there's going to be oil coming from other places and there's going to be technology coming. So we're going to need less of it. And so, you know, this gory story that we're telling, uh, it's a cycle. And there'll be a down, so the industry is breathing a sigh of relief because the down cycle only lasted six months. You know, that's not the end of the story. Well, the only thing to add is, which we discuss is, uh, the, the funny thing when you mentioned the 147 is that um, the investment cycle is, is very pro-cyclical rather than counter-cyclical. It's at the bottom of the cycle when people should be investing in extra capacity, not at the peak of the cycle when they have to compete with Burj Dubai. Oh, uh, Burj Khalifa, um, you know, every, everybody's competing for the same steel. Um, and, and the problem is that most people don't think in terms of the cycle. They think in terms of a target level. And I think Amy has hinted multiple times to specific numbers that, that trigger investment in or non-investment in a particular uh, technology, which uh, I think if, if we contribute anything, it's just to illustrate that the cycle is there. And if you're doing your plan, you should plan for the whole at least next phase of the cycle, if not multiple phases of the cycle. And that would allow you to budget your investment so that you invest at the bottom, not at the peak. And think about, I mean, you're all, you know, from the business. I mean, think about the, the companies or the groups that you know that bought stuff up in 1998 and how well they did between 2002 and 2007. Um, and, and the value creation that was done by co companies like Devon, and in a darko during that time is pretty damn dramatic. If you'd have bought their stock in '98 and then held it, uh, there was a lot of money made, you know, in those seven or eight years. And uh, if you were holding the majors during that time, you didn't make that money. Um, so uh, it is very interesting to think about. And even for the Middle East countries, you know, to think about how to ameliorate the cycle. I mean, the point is. These NLCs all went out, you know, when the price went down to 36, everybody went out and canceled projects. But that's probably not the correct strategy. You know, as a forward, we've been trying since the 1950s to move the center of production from the Middle East to the <coughs> We tried with Egypt. We tried with Libya. Now we have the Gulf, and now we have Brazil. But yet, we have not succeeded, as you say, people go back to the routine. Let's go back to normal because where we can make, quote unquote, the big bucks. Right. They still with the traditional producing area. And that's where we are. And I don't see that changing. I mean, I think that that's the problem, I mean, especially now. I mean, I think the interesting wild card, um, and, you know, they made their statement and everybody, it'll never happen you know, was having the Iraqis stand up the last couple of weeks and saying they're going to 10 million barrels a day. You know, what if they did? What if the Iraqis went to 10 million barrels a day at the same time that Portugal is going to have a successful experiment with plug-in cars, right? You know, what's the five-year or 10-year timeline on that, right? That uh, somehow... You know, we, we, move, we can move oil out of the transportation sector the way we moved it out of the electricity sector in the United States. And at the same time, you're going to have a player like a Iraq come on with big barrels. Now, people might say, listen, it's so unstable there. And, you know, it, 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 that could take decades and so on and so forth. But, you know, there are a lot of people with companies here that have gone to places like Angola that had civil war for how many years? I mean... 
the Chevron people raise your hand. How many barrels did you produce during the Civil War in Angola? It was quite a few barrels, right? So, uh, you know, that's a wild card. Informed as you well, are about well, this. Right, yeah. <laughs> Let's ask the Consul General. He's sitting right here. <laughs>
along those lines, how, how do you explain Ghana and their resistance to Exxon buying into the Jubilee field? You know, I haven't followed that very closely, um, so I can only generalize from uh, from what's changed in the world. You know, Mahmoud talked about contagion and financial markets and globalization. Um, I don't know if any of you went to, there was a book signing a couple months ago or two months ago where Peter Moss was there for the New York Times and he's written this sort of travelogue through the oil world. And, um, and I just think this, I'm not saying that social justice isn't important, but it's, it's like a, a mindset. So, uh, so when, you, um, when you operate in all these countries, you know, there, there are these mindsets about uh, Western companies and their intentions and what's going to happen to me. And I just think that the, the, in Africa, it's just, gonna, it's just hard to operate, right, um, because of these challenges that come at the social level. Oh, what are the key regulatory reforms that you both think are essential? You want to take that first? Well, you want to talk about the loopholes first, the London and hedging loopholes, and, right. and, then, and then talk about how to plug them? <laughs> so, um, so, so Ken's done a lot of work, so I can now say it so that it doesn't sound like I'm just guessing, right? Um, we've looked at, uh, and you know, many of the Rice students we brag about have done the data. Uh, we've taken the CFTC data and sort of analyzed the sort of change of who's in the market. And the numbers are really just astounding. So uh, back before 2000, before Ken Lay and Goldman Sachs went to Congress and got financial players defined as hedgers, you know, in the old days when I used to cover the NYMEX, you, you know, if you wanted, you had a position, strict position limits unless you were an industry player that had real oil. So you got that law changed. And if you look at the statistics, before that law was changed, people who were players in the market, and you, you know, call them what you want, financial players, financial institutions, speculators, non-commercials, you know, call them what you want to call them, they're about 20% of the market. Uh, over the course of time between now and, you know, the time prices got to $147, they were as high as 60% of the volume of the market, open interest in the market. That's a huge change. And um, we don't have the charts, but if you could imagine a chart where this is the line for price, this is the line for industry open interest, and this is the line for non-commercial open interest, right? So, you know, how people come and say, well, it was totally the fundamentals and it has nothing to do with the financial players. Well, you know, the statistics don't bear that out. So then the second level is, well, you know, maybe the financial players just saw these tightening fundamentals of China. Right, but then if you look at the correlation between um, movements in the dollar and movements in the price of oil, uh, prior to 2000, there was no correlation at all. And in 2006, 2007, where a perfect core statistical correlation is one, it was 0.82, right? So clearly, in my view, there was an asset class group that was in the market. They were buying um, based on not, I mean, they had the fundamental story about China and so forth, but if you actually look at the statistics in 2007, Chinese oil demand collapsed. Um, and you could see, I mean, the statistics were in May and June and July as the price was going up, uh, China's oil demand was negative. Right, so people were just saying that, but it wasn't really true. And uh, what they were really doing is moving, you know, assets around based on return. And uh, I was given a presentation to a board of directors meeting, and there was somebody there from Calpers. And so I, you know, I had my little charts, and I'm laying out my theory. And guy stood up and said, "Well, we at Calpers, that's exactly what we do." 
He said, we analyze where we think the return is and we move our money in and out based on nothing having to do with fundamentals. It's just, where's the margin today? Where's the volatility? Where's the margin today? And they moved into oil, uh, hedging, you know, selling the dollar. And, and it, it becomes self-fulfilling. I'm selling the dollar. So now more people want to go in oil as a hedge against the fact that they're selling the dollar. And it's like Mahmoud said, it's just more and more people jump on um, until it becomes unsustainable. And uh, I tell this analogy, you know, Ken and I were meeting with some people from the CFTC. And, uh, you know, they have all these charts that show that the financial guys were starting to get out in April, May, and June while the price was going up. And that's why I always tell my, you know, Dr. Dentist story, right? It's like, well, who was buying if they were getting out? And so I made this analogy up because they were like not getting it about how could they be the front runners of the downturn while the market was going up. And I said, listen, imagine you've got this giant tree with a giant limb over, over you know, a pond and you know, lots of children start climbing on the limb, right? And it looks like so many people are on it. It looks like it's the strongest limb in the world. So more and more and more people get on it, right? And then the guys closest to the trunk of the tree hear a cracking sound. So they jump off. But people are still climbing on because they don't know that happened. They just think they're getting off for whatever reason. They don't know why they're getting off. But they know why they're getting off. Well, the fact that they got off first doesn't mean that the thing wasn't going to collapse and it didn't have to do with all the weight of all the people on there, right? So that's, to me, that was the view of what happened in the market. And... Uh, you know, I, I, we're going to see it again because we're going to go back up now. And uh, I mean, unless OPEC makes an announcement that they're raising production or something, we're going to go back up. And uh, knowing OPEC, they'll probably make the announcement too late. And so the market will already have had the momentum, and then people will excuse the momentum by saying, well, it'll be three months by the time that oil hits the market, and blah, 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 right? And, uh, you know, we're going to get out of control again. And then the way, I, I mean, ultimately, you want to prevent people. From, uh, derivatives are great for, for hedging, um, but, but just like any trade in risk, they can be used for gambling. Um, the speculators, by definition, are people who want to get into the market and get out as soon as they've made their profits. So increasing the transaction costs by doing, uh, you know, uh, imposing a tax on trades is, is, is an easy way out. And also at the country level, that's, that's obviously coming to vogue, even the IMF is starting to buy into it. That that's one way to stop the hot money from flowing in and out of countries or um, commodity contracts. Um, you could also have differential taxation on returns, whether something is genuinely a hedge or not, and remove the provision that it's a hedge if it's a hedge against another gamble. It has to be a hedge against something that's really in your core business, and that's true for most corporations. If, if, if you just buy derivatives to make money on them, you pay a very different tax, and, and the ability to smooth out these profits over the years depends on whether the IRS, say if you're in the U.S., treats it as a true hedge or not. Uh, well, that would require closing another loophole, which is the ability to go offshore. And I heard a lot, including from President Obama himself, about you know closing all the offshore loopholes. But then there was total silence. So we never know if, if this will ever take place. And, and, and you know, I, I, I said this flippantly in a blog, and they commented. But I mean, in the end, you know, the British government is lobbying us to have a strong position on climate. And they want this from us, and they want that from the United States. And, uh, you know, we need to be firm. We need to say, you know, we, are, we want to regulate our markets. You know, one of the things that's made it difficult for the CFTC or the Obama administration to regulate the NYMEX, because we can just say, you know, position limits for anybody who's a financial player. Go back to what we had in, you know, 1999. What's, what was wrong with it? It worked, right? Um, and the reason people are, say, oh, we can't do that, because then all the volume will move to London. Well, you know, the volume can't move to London if we put that, the British do the same thing, and we go to Dubai and have Dubai do the same thing, right? And, you know, why should we have, you know, a cap and trade system here and comply with, you know, what the EU and Britain wants for the climate regime if they're going to just take that volume from us if we regulate our market, and they're just going to make London the center of carbon trading and the center of energy trading, you know? 
it's it's this this thing that people do where they go out to the media and they present the high road that they care about global warming and all we care about is protecting our economy when really there's this gamesmanship of I'm trying to gain the market for myself right i mean it's got to be you know a fair alliance of of equals where everybody toes their weight so if we're going to impose these, you know, we're going to sell to the American public that there should be higher costs uh, through a carbon system, and you know we have to do this because we have global responsibility. Which I, you know, I think the president could sell. You know, I have to show that I'm not moving all this business somewhere else, and that starts with the derivatives markets. You're going to have to, re you know, we have to regulate those first. And I've heard that kicking around Washington, this concept that Waxman Markey can't really move forward until the administration addresses regulations of derivatives markets and commodity markets, because what are you gonna do? You're gonna throw on an extra commodity carbon on these already not properly regulated markets. And so there's some thought that the timeline is we're gonna do healthcare, and then we're gonna do banking regulation. And then after we do healthcare and banking regulation, you know, only then can we really you know, ha address a, a solidified climate bill that integrates it. But to me, the real key is not over, that before we agree to all these things and we have all these things that people want from us in trade and in climate negotiations, we need to tie it all together and say, you know, we're willing to do this on climate if you do this over here on, you know, banking regulation. Another thing I, I should mention that it's it's sort of a market solution and it's actually a profitable one that we suggest and that's where the the huge uh, storage facilities comes in. Well, if, if you know the sovereign wealth funds, you know whose mandate is supposed to be stabilization, uh, in many cases we're investing procyclically. So you have the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, you know, which was the largest, known at 800 billion, um, which made all this money in oil, investing more than half of its money in Norwegian oil and gas. Um, so it's, it's very pro-cyclical, whereas, you know, we say if, if we had that amount of money, we'd create a huge storage place, and we'd do what the SPR wouldn't do. I mean, in the Clinton administration, um, they sold out of the SPR to punish the speculators when it was clearly a speculative bubble, and that popped the bubble. Uh, the Bush administration refused to do the same, and so the bubble got bigger. Uh, and maybe for, you know, they decided that you only use the SPR if there's a natural disaster or some political reason. But why can't we have economic SPRs where you buy when it's low and you sell when it's high? I mean, that's what you're supposed to do, but you need huge storage facilities to do that. And, you know, it, it, this went to the printers be long before uh, the, the thing about the storage in Japan was announced. So we, we'll claim credit for it anyway. So, so, and the thing about the SPR, and you know, I said this at the time to uh, uh, Bodman before he, you know, the government changed. I mean, there was a very clever option out there. And it's always a little dangerous to try to play against the speculators because you, you might not scare them out of the market and then you know, you, you've been ineffective. But I'd like to see someone stand up and say, we're gonna have a test sale. Because that's what the Clinton guys did. You know, we're gonna have a test sale. We're gonna test if we can deliver the SPR through the NYMEX. We're gonna use the NYMEX delivery mechanism. We're gonna sell from the SPR and test whether we can sell the SPR using the NYMEX delivery mechanism. You know, you wanna go bet up a long position against the SPR being sold through the NYMEX? I mean, to me that would have been effective, you know? When your book is in its 10th printed, <laughs> Do you foresee that title being oil, currency, basket, debt, and crisis? Uh -huh. That's my the question. Uh, we hope to sell so many copies that it will still be dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So please come out and join us. <laughs>